I usually go by the nickname Konik. Um, I'm from around this area. I got my uh, bachelor's and master's degrees uh, in computer science over in the neighboring building up there at uh, the Faculty of Mathematics, Physics, and Informatics. And it was also around that time that I started to get a little bit more involved in open source software uh, while I was still a student. Um, so yeah, I'm an occasional open source contributor. I'm not a core member or, or maintainer of any major open source project that you might know. Uh, I just make the occasional contribution here and there whenever I find an excuse to do it in my job. Uh, so far, the only hat I get to wear is that I'm a member of, of the Django Software Foundation. Um, so this talk is targeted at people who have never contributed to open source software. But it's not going to be one of those talks where I would uh, go through the basics like uh, uh, what's a revision control, how to use Git, how to make a pull request, and what's a, an issue tracker, that kind of thing. Um, instead of that, I will try to convince you um, why you should consider getting involved in open source software. And uh, I'll also try to give you some pointers how, can, how you can get started. Um, but even in case you are not entirely comfortable with all those tools that I just mentioned, uh, I will give you some pointers at the end that might help you out. Um, oops. So let's start by getting our terminology clear. I guess most of you are probably at least at some level uh, familiar with the term open source software. But just for the sake of clarity, open source software is uh, software whose source code is publicly available. You can get the source code. Um, you can take a look at it. You can uh, change it. You can play with it. Um, and one thing that I got to experience firsthand is that not all open source software is entirely equal. Uh, I'm, I've mostly been involved in open source projects that are uh, driven by a certain community. So you have projects like uh, Django, you have Python, uh, things like uh, SQL Alchemy and so on. Um, so those are projects where uh, there is a community, worldwide community of people who contribute, who maintain it, who decide on the direction the project is going to take. Uh, and on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have projects that are uh, that have a certain company attached to it that is in charge of all the development, all the decision making. Um, so that's what I refer to as corporate open source, where the open source part is often more like an implementation detail um, and not much community to speak of outside of, of the company. Um, so one example of a project like this might be uh, Chromium, um, where I mean, it, it's a product by Google, right? It's still open source. You can get the source code. Uh, you can inspect it. You can modify it. You can try to build it yourself. But uh, most of the development happens within Google behind closed doors, even if they have like a public bug tracker or, or mailing lists. Uh, it's mostly people from, from that company who develop it and contribute. Uh, and it, it goes even so far that if you, if you go to, to the website and try to look up instructions on how to get started as a contributor, you'll mostly find resources for people. Um, obviously, there's no like clear line between those two kinds of open source. It's, it's more of a spectrum. There are projects somewhere in the middle that are mostly belonging to a certain corporation but have more of a community around them. Uh, but uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on, on the kind that's just driven by by community. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have uh, like two different categories of reasons why you might want to get involved in open source. Uh, one category is more personal reasons, and the other one would be more reasons related to, to the business, to your employer, to like professional reasons. So when it comes to the personal reasons, um, you might feel like you want to give back to the community. I mean, there's so much open source out there, and I don't know about you, but it certainly has made my life much more easy, much, uh, I mean, there's a huge benefit to using all that open source software. Um, 
And you might feel like, yeah, I want to make things even easier for the people who come after me. Um, another reason might be that you want to get uh, fame and recognition for all the glorious uh, contributions you have made, all, all, all the great features you have implemented, all, all the nasty bugs you have squashed in this popular open source projects that are uh, used all over the place. And you might even try to uh, do it to, to uh, impress your interviewers where, when looking for a job. Um, you might do it to become a better um, software developer yourself. Um, there are so many super smart people out there who, who work on open source. And just by collaborating with them, you get to uh, learn a lot from, from them and uh, you get to experience different workflows, different uh, ways of approaching certain problems. Or you might just find that you enjoy it. It's fun. Um, it's really something you might enjoy. I do, for example. Uh, so let's move on to the more professional reasons. Um, many of you are probably employed somewhere and you are working on some kind of product. And so, so your, your employer is in some way monetizing that product. And chances are that you're already using a lot of open source technology to make that product run. Uh, starting from all the uh, Linux or BSD servers that you use to host your services through all the configuration management tools, orchestration tools and uh, automation like container implementations and so on, editors, uh, linters, compilers, language runtimes, uh, all the way to, to the frameworks and libraries that you build your application on top of. Um, if you took all that open source technology away, would your product still exist? Probably not. I mean, you would have this lump of code that wouldn't really do much on its own. So if you look at things this way, all that open source technology is already a part of your product. Um, and it's your job as an employee to make your product better. So one way to do that is to, to improve the open source parts of, of your application, of your product. Um, there is this argument that some, some managers like to make that uh, they're paying you to, to work on your product, not on some random library uh, from some third party. But this completely ignores that this library is already providing a certain feature in, in your product. So if there is an issue with that third party library that affects your product in some negative way, isn't it kind of your job to fix the issue? I mean, it might not affect anyone else in the same way if it affects your product. So you cannot really rely on some random third party maintainer or contributor to fix your problems for you. Um, so um, in what ways can you contribute to open source software? Uh, probably the first thing that comes to most people's minds is to write code, to, to implement new features, to fix bugs. But that's certainly not all there is to, to it. I mean, there's so much other work that's involved in making an open source project run. Um, another obvious thing is uh, documentation. Uh, let me ask you this question. Would you be using all that open source technology that you're using now if you didn't know how to use it? So documentation is really a very important part of an open source project. Um, and there's always room to improve it. Um, another important way of contributing is to, to review incoming patches, review incoming code. If a project wants to remain sustainable over, uh, in the long run, it needs to maintain a certain quality of, of its code base. And reviewing code is one important mechanism to achieve that. It's, it's one of those less glamorous uh, kinds of contributions because you do not le really leave a trace in the revision history, meaning you w will not really have your name attached to the commit unless there is a strong convention of, of uh, noting who reviewed the patch. But it's nevertheless just as important as writing the code in the first place. Another important way to contribute is uh, to triage bugs, especially larger, more popular open source projects. Uh, we'll have a fire hose of incoming bug reports and feature requests. And inevitably, many of those will be uh, 
duplicates or things that are out of scope of that project. Uh, things that um, are really someone, someone abused an API or um, maybe some poor misguided soul is uh, seeking personal support in the wrong place. Uh, and then it's important to somehow sort the issues by priority. So again, this is, this is another uh, often overlooked uh, way of contributing to, to an open source uh, project. Um, and sometimes it, it, it's really difficult to, to get people to do this. And I remember some, some five or six years ago, uh, you know, some core members of, of the Django project used to offer this kind of deal where they would take a look at your bug uh, in exchange for you triaging five other issues. Uh, maybe Adrian can remember that. Uh, another way you can contribute is to, to improve translations. There are so many languages out there. Uh, if, if, if a project is uh, showing any, any messages to the user or, or containing like you know, error messages or that kind of thing. Uh, it's always helpful to, to improve translations, to, pr to translate it to, to more languages. Or you can just hang out in, in support channels like uh, mailing lists, IRC, and w what else there is, and just help out other people. Um, again, this is, this is an important way uh, of, of helping the community grow. It sort of complements documentation uh, because for some people, it's just not as easy to understand written docs in English and they, they need some, some more direction and this is one way to provide it. Um, so let's try to, to imagine now for a while that you're working on your product uh, and you're trying to resolve a bug. Um, so you whip out all the debuggers, you sprinkle login statements all over the place, and after a while of, of, of tracing through the code and reading and scratching your head, you, you, you realize that, oh, it's an issue with one of our libraries that we are using. So, well, bummer, you say. Uh, you, you need this problem fixed right away because you're on a schedule, you have deadlines, you have your sprint and, and whatever else. Uh, uh, workflows you're using at your company. So you need to develop a workaround. You cannot really sit around and wait for, for the current release cycle of that library to, to finish and have a, a fix re released in a stable version. So yeah, you develop a workaround. Nice, problem solved. Let's move on to the next one. And this is what many people would do. I've seen that many times, even in my relatively short career. Uh, but I would, I would encourage you to, to slow down a little bit and, and take a deep breath and think about stuff. Um, at this point, you might very well be the person who knows the most about this issue because you've just spent a lot of time diagnosing it and coming up with a workaround. So if you just move on to the next thing, you're basically just throwing all that knowledge away. Um, so. What happens if you encounter the same issue later? Like it might be all right if you if you stumble on the same bug in in a week or maybe a month later, because you still remember sort of at least in general what you did, how how you fixed it, how you worked around it. Uh, but what if it happens a year later, or if it happens to one of your coworkers who might not know that you were dealing dealing with such an issue, then you basically end up uh, wasting all that time and effort all over again, just to, to figure out the same thing. Uh, so the least you can do is write a bug report, submit the issue to, to the project, uh, keep it out there, uh, keep a record. And while are, you are at it, you just develop the workaround, right? So why not also include that workaround? That might help out other people who, who encountered the same bug uh, before it gets fixed. But you can take it even a little bit further, even though this is already a valuable contribution. Um, you just spend a lot of time diagnosing the thing. You know what triggers it in that library. So why not take the extra few minutes to write down those steps as code and submit uh, a test case for, for that project's test suite? 
Uh, this is very helpful, much more helpful than just describe it in English, because uh, this way it's much easier for, for the maintainers or for other contributors to confirm that there is indeed an issue and rule out cases like, oh, maybe you just didn't use the API correctly. And well, obviously the best case scenario would be that you actually go ahead and fix the issue yourself and just submit a, a, a full patch. Um, sometimes if, when you already have the test case and you know how to trigger it and what is going on there, uh, the extra step to, towards a full solution is not that big. Uh, this is especially the case with uh, smaller issues where just figuring out what is going on is, is really the brunt of the work and the fix itself might be just a one-liner. Uh, but of course, it's not always that easy. So, so if there's a more, like, more involved design issue, it might take some more effort to, to get it resolved. Um, right, but you probably aren't in that kind of situation right now, but what if you still want to somehow get started? There, there are many ways, probably even much easier ways than, than the one that I just described. Uh, many projects have uh, some kind of labels or categories for, for their issues in their bug tracker. So for example, Django has the, the easy pickings category or uh, like uh, Lasse mentioned earlier today, uh, at Koala they have some difficulty slash starter or, or beginner or some uh, newcomer. Um, so those are issues that have been specifically set aside for, for newcomers to, to kind of get warm, warmed up with, uh, to, to experience the entire workflow of getting a, a contribution into the project so that they have an easier time later on when they tackle more, more complicated issues and they do not have to also deal with the, with the process itself. Um, some projects take this even further uh, and offer straight up mentoring. Uh, for example, there's the uh, PyBeware project, which aims to, to bring Python to all the platforms out there. So you could, you could write uh, your native iOS or Android applications purely in Python. And uh, one of the maintainers of, of this project, Russell Keith McGee, often announces that he will mentor new, uh, newcomers, first time contributors, all the way through making a uh, contribution. And uh, as far as I know, it, it's been really successful. Uh, but maybe you're interested in contributing to a project that doesn't offer either of those uh, options. You might still be able to look around and search for uh, some kind of roadmap uh, that will contain e a list of issues that the maintainers consider important to get into the next release. So if you pick something there, uh, there is a chance that they will be uh, more willing to, to help you out uh, sorting or, or getting through, through the entire process and the workflow. Uh, if you're still a student, Another great option is to take part in a Summer of Code pro uh, program. That's actually how I got started uh, as a contributor myself. Uh, I, I did a Google Summer of Code for, for the Django project twice. Um, and so basically it's, it's like an internship, but instead of working for, for some kind of corporation, you're working on open source and you have a mentor assigned. Uh, uh, you might get a financial reward. At first it was just Google Summer of Code, but I think these days there are many more organizations running similar programs as well. Uh, or you might just, as I said before, hang out on IRC, read the mailing lists, respond to people. Not only is this uh, a valuable contribution in itself, but you can also start to notice things that many people struggle with. And after a while you, you start to, to, to see some patterns and uh, and that might be an inspiration for you to, to try to smooth some rough edges out in, in the project or, or what parts could be documented better. And you can turn that knowledge into valuable contributions again. And also it's a really great way to, to get to know the project better. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, 
uh, Django IRC uh, help. I, I've been participating in, in the Django users mailing list. And even without using Django really uh, most of the time or, or like with, with a big focus on it, I learned so much about how you properly use what patterns there are, how you should write your code to, to make it idiomatic, to, to avoid common mistakes. And most importantly, just don't be shy. Um, nobody will expect your contributions to, to be perfect. No, no contribution is perfect. There is always room to improve and uh, any reasonable person knows that. So there is really no reason to feel any kind of embarrassment or shame or be afraid that you might not do the best thing right off the bat. Um, so when you are trying to, to make a contribution, here are some things you should do. Many projects will have a section in their documentation that's, uh, that details all, all the steps you have to take. Like uh, uh, things like where you should report bugs, uh, what the labels are, categories, and that kind of thing how you're supposed to submit patches, whether to write tests, how to write tests, uh, what the code style is for that project. So try to read those docs and try to follow them as closely as possible. Uh, the reason for this kind of structure is to, to put some order into the entire thing, to, to make it easier for maintainers to, to uh, help you out improve the, the, the patch that you are trying to make. Uh, and to, to increase the chances that it will land in, in the project for good. Um, if anything in, in those docs is not clear to you, just do not hesitate to ask. Uh, what do you know? Maybe, maybe if something about those docs is not perfect, you, you might find an opportunity there to, to submit a, an improvement to those docs. Uh, and yeah, if, if you are trying to uh, submit a bug report, try to search the, the issue tracker first, just to avoid uh, creating duplicates. And uh, one thing that many people do not realize is that it's also very, very helpful to say thanks to, to the maintainers and to other community members. Um, when you're using uh, an open source project, most of the time, it it's doing its job flawlessly and you don't really think about it. It's only when it star starts to, to, when it stops working that you, you notice and you realize that something is not, uh, not going uh, right. And so you're frustrated, you, you have an issue that you need to resolve. And this is kind of the state of mind when, when you are submitting an issue. Uh, so even if you're really trying to be cool and trying to be nice, on average, the bug reports that get into an issue tracker will lean towards the negative. And this can wear down the, the maintainers over time. So, so take the time to, to show the maintainers some appreciation, tell them what a great job they're doing. Uh, keep your maintainers happy. It, it will also increase the chances that the project itself will uh, live longer. Uh, and yeah, this brings me to, to the opposite topic of things that you absolutely should not do. Um, there is this screenshot from, from uh, GitHub. This was basically an issue where someone went into the issue tracker and uh, started firing like, you're lying in your documentation. You're saying that I should write this command. When I tried to run it, I got this error. Stop lying in your docs, fix your docs. I'm not interested in any random suggestions by random people out on the internet. Just stop lying. And when one of the maintainers uh, pointed out that the problem was uh, an issue with that person's uh, environment and suggested how to fix that issue. Uh, and also asked them to, to tone the hostility down a notch. This, this was basically the response, uh, more, more vitriol. So there's really nothing good that can come out of this kind of communication. And it happens, sadly, kind of often. Um, same thing with sloppy pull requests on GitHub uh, from people who uh, like often folks who are 
working at a billion dollar startup uh, and uh, they submit a pull request that violates the coding style in every way imaginable and doesn't even solve a real problem. So when it gets turned down, they go into a, a long rant about how the maintainers are wasting their time. There's really no point in doing any, any of this. Um, at, at best, you get banned from the community because you're violating the, the code of conduct. But the, the worst part is that you can drive uh, the maintainers away because why would a maintainer uh, voluntarily be subject to this kind of abuse? So um, keep in mind that uh, even though many people somehow by default think that this is how the, the typical open source project is run with, you know, all the planning and scheduling and, and whatnot, the rea reality is often more like the second panel here. We have just a single maintainer sitting in their computer in the middle of the night, uh, pondering whether they should go to bed already or, or just take a look at one more issue. So, uh, yeah, many open source maintainers and contributors are just doing it because they enjoy it, because it's fun. It's, it's something that they like to do and they really do not have any, any obligation towards anyone. So, so just keep that in mind. Be nice to each other. I mean, be a decent human being and you'll do just fine. Uh, so, yeah, that's... That's all I got. Uh, to, to end this on a more positive note, really just stop hesitating, uh, do it. Uh, what I like to do is basically what I described there. When, when I find an issue with some project, uh, I try to fix it while I'm on the clock because really it's, it's, it's what I like to do. I have an excuse to work on an open source project and it also is valuable for my employer. So uh, stop hesitating, do it. Uh, it's not really any different from what you are doing in your job anyway. I mean, you're, you should already be following best practices like uh, uh, writing docs, writing tests and so on. So it's not really that much different. Um, in case you really are following those practices, if you're not, uh, open source will give you a nice opportunity to learn those things. And I mean, the biggest difference might be that the response times will be a little bit longer than uh, those you get from your coworker who is sitting across the room. But that's really just about it. And uh, I have a couple of links you might be interested in. The first one is uh, basically a collection of many resources, uh, links to, to contributor docs of different projects. Uh, bug trackers with the easy pickings or, or, or starter issues uh, that might get you warmed up a little bit. And the second one is uh, don't be afraid to commit. It's a workshop that will walk you through all the details of uh, submitting a contribution or pull request to, to a Python package, including all the details like how, how you use Git, uh, how to make a pull request on GitHub, how, how to write docs that will be uh, available on read the docs and so on. So in case you're not entirely uh, comfortable with all those tools and concepts, you might find this a valuable resource. So thanks for listening, and I hope to see you in the bug trackers on mailing list and so on. Uh, so, hmm. ah. PyBeware, um, PyBe.org, um, yeah, this is it. Like, uh, it consists of a lot of smaller projects which are basically aiming to, to bring Python to different platforms. So you have uh, uh, compiler from Python to Java for, for Android. You have uh, another thing for, for I, I don't really know much of the specifics. Uh, there's a widget toolkit. Uh, yeah, you might find something interesting in there. And there are, there are lots of very challenging and, and entertaining uh, things to solve there as well.
Since tomorrow we get uh, another one, another question. I want to get my old project to GitHub. I have to push all version, versions uh, or the newer one. The newer. Well, I think it's entirely up to you. I mean, if, if you only have the code locally in your machine, you can either push the entire um, commit history or you can just uh, uh, make a snapshot and, uh, and push that. It, it's up to you. But there's not really any reason not to push. I mean, I doubt there is a single project out there that has a commit history that's like entirely perfect, polished with no flaw whatsoever. And it's also valuable to, to like to look at the mistakes that you have made previously and learn from them. So I would personally opt to, to preserve the history as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. There are no uh, other questions, Russian here, so thank you very much. Okay.